Don't Starve for the longest time has been a game that's been mostly shrouded in mystery. Early on in Don't Starve, the most people knew of the lore was Maxwell tricks someone into entering the constant, and now they're trapped there, only to kick him out of his throne, and now he's surviving there too. Over the years, more lore has surfaced, and several YouTubers added their speculation to the Moines storyline of Don't Starve. For instance, why is Charlie doing this? Who is the moon god she's fighting? The ancient insect race, Methius, etc. And although we may find answers, those that we do find are few and far between. However, I don't want to talk about the main storyline today. I want to talk about one of the most overlooked creatures in all of the constant. The Merms. Everybody stay tuned because I think I have put together a pretty strong theory on not only the Merms and one of the gods of the constant, but the origins of Wurt. After this video, I guarantee you will never look at Merms the same way again. I present to you all, the Merm Theory. Merm's outward appearance resembles some mutated fish beast, and, well, that's what they are. Mutated fish-like creatures just chilling in the swamp, coming out at random intervals and eating plant stuffs. They're also by default mostly hostile, but we'll get back to their hostile nature later. One of the first things I think people notice about merms, unless they're playing in Shipwrecked, is how eerily similar their homes are to that of the pigmen. And while that doesn't say much on its own, most of the survivors just think the houses are run down and broken, and the merms just happen to move in. But Maxwell offers a different perspective. Usually when Maxwell examines a creature, he either brings attention to the fact that he knows exactly what the creature is, or he has no idea how it got there. And since Maxwell can be trusted as a narrator, this means the Merms built these houses themselves, and they intentionally built them in the pig's likeness. But why would the Merms build these houses like this, especially considering how much both they and the pigs hate each other? And, well, the answer to this isn't simple, but it starts in the gorge with the monster known as the Gnaw. The Gnaw is the main antagonist of the Don't Starve event known as the Gorge. In the Gorge, you craft food for the Gnaw, the giant jagged circular rows of teeth in the sky, and if you mess up and it gets too hungry, you are violently and quickly transformed into a Merm. And this was where the origin of the Merms originally laid to rest, but there's quite a bit of lore here that can give us a few more hints about the Gnaw. The first one comes from an achievement you get from feeding nine foods that the Gnaw is craving called Spoiled Worm. What a worm is, is a species of dragon that possesses no arms, legs, or even wings. And being a species of dragon, the worm is also covered in a layer of thick scales. You see where I'm going with this, right? The Gnaw isn't just turning people into fish for shits and giggles, it's transforming them into creatures like itself. Oh, okay, but that doesn't prove the fish part. However, worms in mythology were also known to dwell in the ocean, and were often also known as sea serpents. So I searched up sea serpent curse, and one of the very first creatures I found was the Greek monster known as Charybdis. Charybdis was a sea monster of unknown species, whose origin came from her assisting her father Poseidon in retrieving land from Zeus by engulfing them in water. Zeus, enraged by this, cursed Charybdis and transformed her into a hideous bladder of a monster, with flippers for arms and legs and an uncontrollable thirst for the sea. God, that sounds awfully familiar. Cursed to be in likeness to a fish person, and just replace uncontrollable thirst with hunger and you have the gnaw. But for some people, that might not be enough evidence. I mean, it's only two pieces, and only one's true if I say it's hunger instead. Here's what really sold it for me. I looked up several illustrations of Charybdis, and most of them match the description. Large, scaly body, lives in the ocean, but the most prominent physical feature that every single one of them showed is... Well, look at its mouth. Every single depiction of Charybdis I found involves massive rows of jagged teeth munching down in a whirlpool-like way, exactly like the Gnaw. But wait a minute, the Gnaw is depicted as being in the sky, not in the ocean. And I thought about this for a minute and what it might mean, especially considering most depictions of Charybdis' mouth are being in a massive whirlpool. But thinking it over and remembering that the Gnaw is considered a worm, this theory actually still makes sense. The gorge is still an island surrounded by water, and if the gnaw is truly a worm, couldn't it just arch its long body over the town so that its mouth is directly facing over the island? And the part that proved this, this is that most islands in the constant are surrounded by water, 
excepting Hamlet, which conveniently has no merms on the island. Okay, so the Gnaw is a reference to the Greek monster Charybdis, and much like Zeus's curse, it also curses other creatures to be like it. Okay, what does this have to do with merms building pig houses? Well, it's not hard to find out from talking to the locals, but the Gnaw has not only mermified the entire town, but it's destroyed the minds of anything around it. Talking to Pipton and Sammy, two of the four remaining residents of the goat town, and in reality just taking a walk around the block, you quickly learn that the entire town isn't just dying, but it's already dead. From what it looked like, two races lived on this island together, one being sort of a goat people race and another being, well, another pig sub-faction. And as you can see by simply talking to the merm selling you stuff, conveniently to help you make food, this was once a prosperous town where the two races lived in harmony until the Gnaw came and forced their entire lifestyle to center around feeding it. One of the townspeople claimed that a majority of the people have left after succumbing to mermification, no doubt using their fish-like ability to salvage what they can of their new forms away from the Gnaw. All they can do now is escape or risk being in service to the Gnaw for the rest of time, doomed to eventually go feral without the Gnaw. And make no mistake, both of the merms still left in the town are 100% without a mind. Sammy is described as slowly going insane whilst Pipton watches over him, when in reality, both the Merms have already lost their minds, along with any free will, as both speak positively of the Gnaw, despite it being responsible for destroying their world. And it gets worse than that. The Merms we find on other islands are immediately hostile. That's because they've essentially gone mostly feral in their new mermified forms. The Gnaw doesn't just twist your form and manipulate you into feeding it if you stick around. If you leave its presence, you'll likely immediately succumb to madness. That's why merm houses look so much like pig houses. Not because they respect or admire the pigs, but because they literally can't think to make anything better. This can also be seen with the Elder Pig, the leader of the second faction who, for lack of a better word, likely knows he doesn't have much time left. The curse on his hand has already began to spread, and unlike most other pigs, this one seems to genuinely care about his people. He's polite to the player and he worries what the pigs will do without his leadership. The Gnaw's curse is likely clouding the Elder's mind. Not that they have many places to go, but he hasn't told his pigs to flee yet either, and he even wants them to stay and rebuild the pig houses. Not only is the Elder playing directly into the Gnaw's hand, but the Gnaw is making sure the Elder keeps the rest of his subjects in the gorge to no doubt mermify the rest of them too once their leader succumbs to it. The Gnaw is so incredibly evil. And that's why the Merms are in the constant. They were once an intelligent race of goats and swamp pigs who were subject to the chaos that a deity caused in their little town. This is also why you don't ever find merms on Hamlet, because the merms swam to other worlds, and Hamlet is in the sky. They're here now because they tried to escape the Gnaw before they became enslaved to it, and now they're just mindless drones doing the Gnaw's bidding. Except, feral merms don't obey the Gnaw. The Merms we see in the Constance Main Island, or Reign of Giants, are clearly distinct from the Merms we see in the Gorge and that they don't possess the same modicum of intelligence, and because of this, I don't think the Gnaw has complete control over them, if any at all. So far, the only intelligent Merms I've mentioned are the ones still trapped inside the Gorge. When you first see Merms in the Constant, given you aren't worth, their first and only reaction is to attack you if you're near their homes. The reason why they can attack comes back to Maxwell's earlier statement. The merms you fight in the constant are barely conscious of their actions, as shown by their inability to even build good homes. I mean, four merms per one rundown house cannot be comfortable. Pigs likely either took notice of the pig houses and assumes the merms raided the pigs, or the pigs simply see the merms as monsters. And pigs, not being the brightest tools in the shed themselves, declared war on the merms, sprawling into an all-out conflict that still lasts in the constant to this day. Whenever you start up a world, you'll likely get distracted by random said piece. Because the merms and pigs still have this war going on. And the reason feral merms attack you is likely because of how pigs are more often than not the first allies of the player. The merms have too little intelligence to reason otherwise that you might be a friend rather than a foe. Okay, let's go back to the intelligent merms at the gorge. Here's how I think the Gnaw's curse of works when it affects the brain. Once you become a merm, you immediately lose all ability to hold your own intelligence, outside basic motor functions and survival instincts. However, merms when near the Gnaw are given back their intelligence for the purpose of feeding it. And that's why what's so sad about becoming a merm. 
Once the gnaw has you, you either stay near it and continue to feed it anyways while simultaneously being brainwashed to embrace the gnaw, or you slowly turn into a feral animal, barely capable of building your own shelter. You ever notice that the only merms inside the gorge are conveniently only there to sell you stuff that just so happens to make food for the gnaw? Yeah, that's why. Okay, but what about the merms at Shipwrecked? Specifically the Fisher merms. Not only do the merms at Shipwrecked have actually decent looking houses, but they know how to use tools, the fishers won't attack you, hell, they even have names and will sometimes talk in almost English. Why are these merms intelligent but are far away from the gnaw? Except they aren't far away from the gnaw at all. Inside the volcano, you'll find the Altar of Snacrifice, which happens to be the same wording that the one in the gorge uses. And the altar's demands even have a wide variety of fish meat it accepts that is conveniently being fished by the fishermen. This means the gnaw has been to shipwrecked as well and is holding these merms hostage with the volcano instead of completely dumbing them down. I'm not entirely certain of the synaptic influence of the gnaw or how the altars work. However, this is a very clear distinction between intelligent merms and feral merms when the gnaw is present. And this makes sense, as the gnaw likely can't exist everywhere at once, so it sets up altars wherever it knows it has merms, who keep them just smart enough to deliver it fast food. And I would say that pretty much explains why merms are in the constant, where they are, and why they act the way they do. If not for one single character, that raises several questions. Wart the merm child. This raises one of the biggest questions about merms, and that is, can merms reproduce? Now, spoiler alert, I actually think this point is kind of a bummer in my eyes. The reason being, I just don't think there's enough evidence to entirely go one way with it, especially depending on how you think Wirt was born, but I'll entertain the idea anyways. First theory is, if merms can reproduce, it likely relies heavily on fish, as merms seem to always have a kinship with fish. Pretty much every merm carries one, but they're never dead. Merms could potentially subject the fish to the same transformative process as themselves, causing the fish to slowly transform into mermfolk, until it splits off as another merm, aka where it used to be a little fishy. Second theory, merms just reproduce the same as any sexual species where it was simply a child of merm coitus. I don't think this one is super likely since we don't see any other merm children, but then again the same can be applied to pigs with the exception of Wilba. Third theory is merms simply can't reproduce on their own and Wirt was simply turned into a merm as a child. This third theory was made by Orange, Wax another Don't Starve, Starve YouTuber, who makes the comparison that Wirt is only intelligent now because she was turned. And although this is a possibility, I don't think this one is super likely due to the simple fact that all merms look the same when they first turn. Also, Wirt is more or less well versed in merm culture and even praises aspects of it. And although those are trends of those who recently turned by the gnaw who can still think to embrace their mermification, Wirt only displays knowledge of merm culture despite her being intelligent. There's never any reference to Wirt's past simply due to the fact that the merm culture is her past. I think any one of these could stand as a working theory for merm reproduction, but I don't think any of them apply to Wirt, and that is due to the simple reason that Wirt isn't like the other merms. Wirt is smart. She's not a genius, but she's smart enough to clearly be distinguished from the other merms in the constant. She's smart enough to use tools, understand friends outside of other merms, and she's even smart enough to read. Keep in mind she isn't great at reading because she's still a child, but she can read. Okay, so if she's so smart, where'd she come from? And I have a theory for that. So we're going back to the gorge, we learn a basic concept of how mermification works. And it's that mermification affects larger creatures differently. Both Mumsy and the Elder Pig have been infected by mermification and are slowly turning. However, anything smaller transforms into a merm almost instantly. So here's my theory. There's only two ways to escape the gorge. Either earn the gnaw's favor and teleport out, or become mostly, if not entirely, mermified and then swim out. Wirt's mother was one of these go people that we see in the gorge before the gnaw came through. She was likely mostly turned by mermification by the time she realized she has conceived Wirt. Due to her mermification, she has was able to make the swim with the other merms to another constant island. But by the time she got there, it was too late, and she became another less than intelligent merm. However, it wasn't too late for Wirt, who was thankfully born smart and not entirely mermified in the brain. And I think this is best shown by the two horns on her head, as proof of both her origins as the daughter of a goat person, and a reminder that the gnaw hasn't taken away her gift of intelligence. 
But yeah, that's the Merm theory. Their history of oppression and war and how Wirt is likely the last member of the goats race, save for Billy and Mumsy, who will likely only remember the future of their people as a feral, angry fish. But and wait, 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 wait. Why are the Merms suddenly friendly to you? All right, here we go. So we know Wirt, regardless of what you think her origins are, is at the very least friends with other merms. And we know based off of both of her description and her examinations of Wicker's books that she's at the very least friends with other survivors. And in creation of a merm king, all the merms become friendly. However, non words can only interact with the merm king and use merms if they're wearing a merm disguise. So wouldn't that discourage you from thinking that you're doing anything more than just fooling some merms into thinking you're on their side? And my answer to that is the merms know you're wearing a disguise. How did I come to that conclusion? Well, try and befriend a merm guard with a disguise on. Yeah, it's not happening. That's because the merm guard sees right through your disguise, and quite frankly, it makes sense in the Don't Starve universe. Both pig guards and mant warriors will see right through your disguises and attack you anyways, but merm guards don't. More on that in a minute. So maybe you're just only able to fool regular merms and it doesn't work on guards because they're too smart. And that would certainly make sense that the merm guards are smart. I mean, look at the horns on their head. More on that in a minute too. So why make us wear the mask to work with the merms and trade with the king? And I think it's as simple as it's part of the merms culture. Merms are clearly smarter or at least more sociable when they have a merm king. And remember, only work can make the disguises. So when merms see members of other species looking like a merm and smelling like a merm, they see them as friends of their kind. And since only merms like work can make the disguises, it would only make sense that trusted friends of merms would be wearing disguises. And thus the king only trades with friends of merm folk. The only reason the merm guards aren't willing to help you is simply because they have more important things to do, like protecting important merms. However, regular merms who aren't particularly important in merm royalty are more than willing to lend a helping hand to a friend of the merms. One more part of the disguise part of this theory, does this mean that feral pre-merm king or post-merm king merms are also not fooled by this disguise? And my answer to that is, seeing as to how they immediately turn hostile if you take it off near them, but if you attack a merm only when you are wearing a mask, no merms come to its aid. Therefore, I think that, yes, when there is no king, you actually are fooling merms into helping you. This doesn't apply to the guards, who still have their horns and are thus smarter. Their king may be dead, but they still have a job to do. Man, they really earned the title of loyal merm guard. Okay, so the merms have evolved because of the Merm King, but we're still left with quite a few questions. What does the Merm King do that suddenly makes merms smarter and more sociable? And why are merms the only race that has guards that are sociable enough to not declare every creature as an enemy? Why are merm guards suddenly growing horns like Wirt and the Goat People? How does the Merm King know how to do this? And most importantly, who is the Merm King? Isn't it obvious? The Merm King is the Elder Pig! Okay, hold up, wait a minute. How is that even possible? Well, it honestly depends on how the curse works. Remember why I said the only two ways you escape the gorge is to either teleport out with the Gnaw's favor, or you swim out as a merm. Since we know the Elder Pig was reluctant to leave, as it wanted to fix the pig houses, it likely didn't leave until after it was fully mermified. However, somewhere along the way, the Elder Pig Merm somehow learned how to not only fully articulate its speech again, something even Wirt struggles with, but also knows how to bring back some form of intellect with all the merms near it. Now I do have a good theory on why the Merm King is able to do so, but one thing I know for sure is that the Merm King is the Elder Pig. Not only because he happens to be a leader of one of the same two species that were turned into merms, but because, well, look at the comparison of the Elder Pig's model to that of the Merm King. The resemblance is practically dead on. They're both sitting in a similar pose, they both have a similar body type, they both have beards, they're both slightly arched forward, they're both even holding something in their right hand. Now Clay does sometimes reuse mob models and then just draw different details on them, like in the case of primates and spa monkeys. However, this isn't the case here. They pretty clearly completely redrew a brand new Merm King, but chose to draw it in the Elder Pig's image. This was an intentional design. But wait. How is that possible? The Elder Pig is massive compared to a standard merm, and in order to become the king, he has to be a regular merm at some point. And my answer to that is the same as why I don't think Wirt was a child turned into a merm. It's because all merms look mostly the same when they first transform. That includes pigs, every single survivor, and even the goat people. 
The proof for this is the two merms, Sammy and Pipton, still inside the gorge. Both of them used to be goats according to Billy, and if they are both believed to be adults when they turn, that means even if they are as large as Mumsy, they would still shrink down to the default size of a merm. Okay, so that's pretty solid evidence that the Merm King is the Pig Elder, and there's a valid reason why the Pig Elder would then become a leader of the Merms. But that still doesn't explain how the Merm King is able to enlighten and empower all the Merms. And more importantly, how it's able to grow the Merms' horns back. Wait, yeah it does. It's because the Merm King's using the same power the Gnaw is! So what we know about the Gnaw's power so far is that its main means of attack or harassment is a curse it can apply to any creature nearby to transform them into a merm, which after being away from the Gnaw for some time will most likely go feral. The curse affects bigger creatures more slowly and there's no proof that it can be stopped once it starts. Also judging on all the buildings destroyed, the Gnaw might also have some destructive abilities. That or it can compel merms to be violent when it needs them to be. Pretty much everybody in the constant is well aware that merms aren't pushovers when it comes to combat. Out. And seeing as how Mumsy is wearing a funeral veil, it also probably has some way of just flat out killing people. We also know that the Gnaw has a certain amount of control over the gorge, deciding who gets to leave and who gets to stay. And all that happens to line up with what the Merm King can do. Minus the Mermification part, but more on that in a minute. When the Merm King rises, Merms become stronger, more friendly towards players, and more competent to work with. The Merm King, like the Gnaw, can also teleport creatures right next to it. In this case, Merm guards in order to protect itself. And most importantly, it requires a large amount of food to do so. And since we know that the Mont Gnaw isn't just turning creatures into fish people, and that it's transforming them into a similar aquatic beast like itself, it's not impossible to assume a leader of the Merms can also tap into this power. And so far, all of this sounds good. The Merm King making Merms friendly, only asking for food in return, and offering trade. But why do the Merm Guards still have their horns? And equally as importantly, where is the Merm King summoning them from? Could it be that the Elder Prig turned Merm King is just as bad as the Gnaw? That it found more goat people and now it's turning them into its own personal bodyguard as a new smarter minion? Maybe the Merm King is the reason why we haven't seen any more goat people! But... that's just not true. Merm guards could possibly be warped in from the gorge, as since both the merms and the gorge are wearing hats, we don't know if they have horns too. But if this theory is to be believed, this means that the merm king can not only teleport creatures from a long distance to itself, but can also turn them into merms from a long distance, something I doubt even the gnaw can do. Secondly, we know merms can grow new horns as proven by the child words. Therefore, I offer a different explanation. And it's that merm guards are a new type of merm that starts evolving when the gnaw can't control them, but are still exposed to some of its power. We already know how the gnaw functions, it slowly drains an area's food supply, and as it does it mutates and takes away sentient creatures free will until they become nothing more than servants, and then later feral animals. Except instead of the gnaw slowly taking away a merm's free will until it turns mindless, the Merm King is slowly giving their free will back. And the evidence that the Merm King's presence is what's causing them to grow new horns is that when the Merm King dies, the Merm Guard's horns start to fall off. The Merm King does still demand food, as he's likely developed a much stronger hunger in his position. However, unlike the Gnaw, the Merm King's hunger isn't endless. He doesn't ask for more food than he needs, and he isn't picky. And why is he doing all this? Well, this might be an optimistic answer, but I think it's because the Elder Pig is a good person. A quality and compassionate leader is a concept that's almost completely foreign to most Don't Starve faction leaders, but the Elder Pig genuinely cared about his people. Being the leader of one of the two races that lived together peacefully in the Gorge, he's polite and reasonable enough to work with members of other races. His fluent English as the Merm King and voice lines in the Gorge give both of these away when talking to him. And due to some miracle, he managed to put himself into the position of King. Fortunately, he never truly lost his social skills to Mermification, and as much as the Merms have the Merm King to thank, the Merm King has Wirt to thank. Wirt's undamaged brain and childlike optimism was, in all reality, exactly what the Elder Pig needed to be reminded of, exactly what it's protecting as a leader. It's really fortunate Wirt overheard that story about a bog monster and thought they were talking about a Merm King. Now the Merm people have an actual chance at life outside of the Gnaw, and potentially one day to see their people's former glory return. And of course, the Merm King, Wirt, the survivors, and the Merms will be ready now, should the Gnaw ever find them.
And that is the Merm Theory, a heartbreaking story of how two races who once lived together peacefully were robbed of their free will, oppressed as their society slowly collapsed, turned into some form of chimera, and eventually robbed of their own minds too, leaving both their races on death's door by a cold, unfeeling deity. But also, a hope for the future of their people, thanks to two who may very well be the last cognizant members of their own race, the Merm King of the Swamp Pigs and Wurt of the Goat People. And although Wurt might not know that she actually is a goat person, her quote still stands true that she does have bright plans for the future of Mermkind. And whether her compendium intended on it or not, she will bring her people back to their former glory. But that's just a theory. Oh, get <laughs>